Jupiter and Uranus come together on April 20th, 21st, depending on where you live. It's an 84 year cycle in the sign of Taurus. Hey, we last saw this in 1941, the beginning of the UFO thing with the Roswell incident and also new technology and industry and the United States getting into World War II. In terms of big cycles, when Jupiter and Uranus come together, we see shifts, quantum leaps, big breakthroughs. And what I want to talk about here is I did an interview with Dan Waits of World Astrology Report in December, and we dove into the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction as well as other big planetary cycles and how it impacts our world. Because the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is coming to us soon, I'm recording this for you on April the 11th, I'm going to reissue that video that came out in January or December, and I'm going to put it here for the rest of this show. There are timestamps uh, below from the original video, but it's not going to be quite the same because I've added an intro. Um, so forget the timestamps, just listen and enjoy it. Um, this is a intro to a video that was already recorded. And just want, want you to know some of the things we're covering in this video, because if this doesn't make you curious as all hell, then I think that maybe you've lost your curiosity bones, right? We talk about UFOs. We talk about cycles of wars in history, inventions, etc. And some of the time, types of cycles we're talking about besides the UFO and alien stuff and the world are things to do with the archetypal energies of the planets, the Neptune-Pluto cycle, the Pluto and Aquarius transits, AI, and the Middle East as well. Now, we record this Middle East content. We very lightly touched on it for a bit about the Middle East and its trajectory. Um, so that's all in there as well. Now, some of you are timestamps lovers. We even talked about evolution, but I'm not timestamping this video. It's a conversation for you to listen to. Settle in with a cup of coffee. I love his channel. Go check out World Astrology Report. We're going to do a thing together again soon. We're talking about maybe when he's really busy changing the nature of his channel, but he's one of my absolute favorite archetypal and mundane astrologers. So Dan Waits is uh, one of my go-tos for my own entertainment when I'm watching a astrology. <laughs> I go, who do I love to watch? I loved uh, Astrolada. I love Dan Waits of World Astrology Report. Um, I love when Trifon is on Astrolada's channel, one of my favorite Babylonian astrologers. Those are some people I love to listen to. So I'm going to attach, I'm going to attach the video to the intro, go settle in and let's see what you have to learn from the big picture story of the cycle of Jupiter Uranus as it affects the world. As for stuff about your sign, go check out in the description box. I'll add the link. My Jupiter Uranus conjunction story for each sign that I came out with in December. It's at 80,000 views. You go listen to that. And I'm putting a new one out, or it will already be out as well, where I also talk about some different elements in the same narrative that I didn't address for your sign in my video. So there's two videos I put out about the Jupiter Uranus conjunction synodic cycle. It impacts your life for 14 more years in the Taurus part of your sky. Thanks, guys. Hope you enjoy the Dan Waits interview. I'm releasing it again for you guys here. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And hey, I'm Lori Lothian, <laughs> Lunatic Astrology. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. This is a Western tropical channel, not sidereal. The biggest sky event of 2024 is the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in the sign of Taurus in the month of April. It is a huge synodic cycle that last happened in 1941, before that 1858 in Taurus, and before that in 1181. We're going to be talking about how this cycle plays out in our world through world history events and what it might mean for us in this time. Tip, hint, UFOs, aliens, um, aerial phenomena, maybe even some breakthroughs in technology. Our guest today is Dan Waits of World Astrology Report, who makes it his specialty to discuss and learn about world cycles. And one of the things about him is that he's not only an astrologer, content creator, and a, a um, consulting astrologer, but he is also somebody who's explored this the whole world as a humanitarian worker in places like Thailand, Papua New Guinea, and during these magical explorations of the world as a humanitarian worker, he discovered the art of astrology and made it his passionate purpose. We're going to be talking to him about the sky event, so stay tuned while I let him into our room today. Okay, let's see what happens this time. You're connected to audio. 
Yes, it worked. <laughs> okay, we have to redo hey. this. Okay, now I can't believe you came in. I forgot to pause the recording. So I'm okay. So let's leave it like this. Let's just leave it like this. It's very ad lib. So everyone coming into the room with Dan and I today, like watching this later on, um, we could not get this to work. It is so mercurial and mercury retrograde. And every time we came together, we had no visuals. So welcome, Dan, to our discussion today. Thank you so much for having me, Laurie. Okay, that so we, we finally, finally made it. Yeah. Did we know what the gremlin was? Did we discover it? I don't think I think it's going to remain a mystery. I think the the trickster was just uh, having some fun. Okay, well that's good to know. Yes, I, 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 these things happen when we're doing shows like this. And so, welcome. So I just introduced you a little bit about the fact that you were wandering the world, traveling, doing humanitarian work, and then you discovered astrology. And you're really uh, the guy who looks at the synodic cycles and world events and history and pieces it all together. And um, I, maybe you just share a little bit about uh, more about your beginning of becoming an astrologer. I love your channel. I've been following World Astrology Report ever since maybe a year ago and watching you grow really rapidly. And I thought, finally, someone's bringing a really intelligent look at world events and mundane astrology to YouTube land. So I uh, tell us a little bit more about discovering astrology while you were traveling around the world well um yeah i was traveling around the world working for an international humanitarian organization so you know i lived in all sorts of different places and and a lot of what i was focused on was kind of geopolitics world events you know i worked in a lot of war zones so i was always, always really interested in that kind of thing um but my travels also took me to some places like Thailand, Myanmar, Papua New Guinea. These are places where people really, um, people have a very different uh, view of uh, reality and the cosmos in general. People are much more apt to believe in in spirits and magic and and so on. And I think over time that really just uh, just sank in, um, and I started to start to think, you know, is my kind of is my materialist perspective? You know, am I so sure that that's actually the way the world really is, you know, it kind of starts, you start to feel like it's a bit, I mean, it's arrogant to kind of presume that people around you are the deluded ones and, and not you. So, you know, so yeah. I think it just opened me up to different perspectives and the possibility that the framework that, that I'd kind of come to, to rely on was, was actually maybe just completely wrong about how the world really is. Um, so I started, I started messing around with, um, with divination, the I Ching, things like that. And uh, and I and then about like six years ago, I so not really that long ago, but I, I started pl uh, playing around with astrology, and uh, you know I was pretty interested in what I um, what I saw of it. I was like I just felt that it was saying something about me that uh, seems to seems to be a, a little bit more right than it should be. You know, I, I kind of felt spoken to even just looking at my own chart and. Um, getting into astrology in the way that most people do, just you know, messing around on on, on the usual pop astrology sites and all that stuff. But I also read um, Cosmos and Psyche by Richard Tarnas, and that was a book that really blew me away because it's all about planetary cycles, big synodic cycles, history, and and it and it made me think, you know, maybe this maybe it's worth taking this astrology stuff seriously because this guy is obviously a, he's a very like erudite scholar who thinks that that, that it really works and that there's something to it and you can look at history through this frame so I, I got quite into it and I remember back then um I did um I did notice that a lot of astrologers were talking about 2020 and they were saying 2020 is going to be this 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 year of um I think I remember the phrase great transformation and uh, societal reset and all these things and I remember thinking you know that sounds kind of uh, kind of scary and I really, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I'm ready for that you know they were talking about this big pileup of planets in January 2020 everything is going to change you know the, mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to kind of move into a new world and all this kind of stuff and and I remember thinking yeah that sounds um, a little bit maybe I'm not I'm not sure if I'm quite ready for that you know and and I I, I sort of um almost kind of forgot about it or pulled back from it for a while. And then 2020 rolled around and well, we oh, all know yeah. what good old Pluto, Saturn, good old pandemic, good old world changing, you know, epoch shifting stuff. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. The thing with astrology for me, you know, I got into it when I was very young and uh, was casting charts in the 80s by hand. I mean, crazy, but that still stayed at the pop psychology level. And it wasn't until 2018 when I studied Hellenistic astrology with Adam Ellenbust, uh, who's changed his name back from a true Bava of nightlight astrology, that all the pieces clicked for me. Like it was almost like, oh my God, this is so this is so relevant to my chart. This is so relevant to my experience of reality. And then later on, I went and learned a lot about archetypal astrology as well. So it's once you see your life through the lens of astrology and the world about you through the lens of astrology, you begin to see that, um, you know, that alchemical refrain, uh, as above, so it is below, and as it is below, so it is above, this kind of mirror effect, you know, that the, the planetary cycles are rhythmic, repeatable, and predictable, and they're not causing our life, they are mirroring events. I don't think they're causal forces, but it, it, does, it does boggle the mind. <laughs> And it's certainly not a rational materialistic way of looking at the world. It brings back the mystical, the magical. It brings us back in touch with uh, the Robert Moore quote that I really love. I'm going to mangle it, but um, the soul has an absolute unforgiving need for regular excursions into enchantment. It needs it like the mind needs thoughts and the body needs food, something along those lines. And I always thought that quote spoke to me about why astrology is so fascinating, because it brings us back in touch with the mystery and also the sense of inevitability, you know, like life is happening and we don't always have agency over it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I really felt that. Um, I think a few for years before I discovered astrology, I, I felt this sort of disillusionment with with the world and with my worldview. You know, that had that is this really all there is kind of kind of thought that I think a lot of people get at, at certain times in their, in their lives, particularly today. Um, and and it was really um, for me, it was a discovery that that um, meaning existed beyond um, my own head and everybody's heads you know that we have these meanings that are that we've attached to to these heavenly bodies and then when we see events both in our own lives and in the world synchronizing and but not only synchronizing but also um, reflecting the meanings that we've attached to uh, or, or maybe have been passed to us for yeah. these um, heavenly bodies then it shows you that actually life is fundamentally meaning meaningful you know and that's that's so important. I think. I think. I, I feel it's one of the things that drives me in my own astrology because I, I want to, you know, sort of astro pill other people because it was such a important experience for me. And I know there are lots of people out there who are maybe on the fence or um, with this kind of thing and really could do with with, with that confirmation that their um, life, yes, is meaningful. Yeah, I love that idea of the yeah, the red the astro red pill, you know, <laughs> the very matrix moment with Neo. Um on your website, because we're gonna talk today, I introduced us as talking about the Jupiter Uranus conjunction and its cyclical quality, but also um, we may tiptoe into Pluto uh Neptune stuff. But you know, I love on your website the uh, way you've shared your what you do. Like you say, make sense of your story, uncover the hidden threads of meaning running through your life. And we're back to that key word to to find meaning in reality. And I think that's what most people are yearning for. They think that they don't know what they're missing. They're missing a sense of meaning. And I think that's what astrology opens us up to is the, the quest for meaning. Now, you don't always just get one single answer, but you get a sense of uh, divine, a divine mind at play. I want to say, you know, for me, the turning point with astrology wasn't even just Hellenistic astrology. I was at the NCGR conference in 2000 and. 19 pre-pandemic. And uh, I went into one of the rooms to listen to, um, oh my goodness, what's his name? Alex uh, Astrology. Alex Asteroid Astrology is his website, I think. But the guy is like absolutely in the rabbit hole of the minor asteroids. And I, when I left his presentation, my, my whole reality changed. And for me, that even adds another weird layer to life. You know, I have a client who... Um, you know, it works with Ken Wilber and the asteroid Wilbur is on his midheaven. Another client who channels David Bowie for one of the things she does, channels the dead David Bowie. The asteroid David Bowie is on her midheaven. I have a sommelier or two in my client base. Dionysius or Bacchus, the asteroids for wine and the, you know, for fermented grape are on their midheaven. And then you begin to ask really, really deep questions. It's like, how could this be true? How could I be born and then find that I have these incredibly specific asteroids, including people's names, aligned in my chart at critical places at intimate degrees? And it is true. It's like just true, right? 
Absolutely. I, and have I, you I have gone similar, down that rabbit yeah. hole? Have you, have you done that I, yet? I have. I mean, my, uh, the asteroid bearing my mother's name is within, uh, is less than a degree from my IC. So you know, right down at the uh, root. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't make this stuff up. And, and yeah, one of my colleagues, Gary Caton, who um, I just interviewed for a Mercury overview in 20, 2024, he, he was delighted to find that Stargazer is on his ascendant, the asteroid, because he started astrology by looking up the sky and hearing the planet Jupiter, I think, tell him you must, you know, you must do astrology or something when he was young. But then later with Demetra George, he just discovered another asteroid called Astro Wizard on his descendant. <laughs> and if you ever look at Gary, he's got one of these beards that he ties in a knot and he looks like a medieval wizard. So, you know, again, you know, it just boggles the mind. So now that we've done that, uh, OMG, uh, is it real or Memorex astrology red pill conversation? Let's talk about Jupiter and Uranus. They're together Jupiter. in, yeah, they're together in April. And we last had them together. By the way, everybody, it's like April the 20, 21st, depending on where you live, around 20, 21 degrees of Taurus. And the last time we saw them joined together in the sign of Taurus in the Western tropical Zodiac was 1941. And before that, 1858. And before that, 1181, I was trying to dig around for phenomena, events, and uh, archetypal themes for those times. Um, and I, and I, you're the archetypal guy. So we'll, I'll let you lead a bit. Um, but Uranus, you know, rebellion, freedom, and maybe innovation, sky God, <clears throat> uh, unexpected or shocking things. And then we have Jupiter, you know, Jupiter in, in traditional astrology, truth, wisdom, knowledge, dispeller of darkness, um, but also the the king of Mount Olympus as well, like in just Zeus kind of mythology, and uh, also connected to the lineage, right? Because Uranus, Saturn, uh, Jupiter, this is his upline, this is his family history. Uh, and also Uranus, Uranus, Uranus being the, uh, you know, mating with Gaia and having children, right? So sort of like the heavens mate with the earth and something is born from it. So those are general themes I have about the Uranus energy mating with or meeting with this uh, Jupiter energy. Uh, what, what are some of your thoughts in general about it? Yeah, but Jupiter, Jupiter Uranus is, um, it, it's, it's one of those combinations where the two planets, they do have a, a fair bit in common. It's not like, uh, you know, a Saturn, uh, Saturn Uranus combination, say, where you've got one of these kind of real odd couple pairings where, you know, Saturn is all about, is all about, you know, the, the status quo or that which has been or that which endures and Uranus wants to, to smash everything to pieces and make, make it new. You know, and then you have these very different pairings, whereas Jupiter and Uranus seem to have um, some some things in common. And I think I think one of them is um, perhaps a concern with with truth and revelation and 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 also freedom. I think um, you know Jupiter has this expansive quality. It's associated with growth and. And you can't really grow when you're kind of held within within fixed structures, in a, you know, you know, as Saturn might like to have us. So, you know, Uranus is interested, I think, in in release, and that kind of pairs very well, I think, with with uh, Jupiter's concern with growth and expansion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you yeah. think about their their associations with you know with with um, with questions of truth and uh, revelation and you really see that running through a lot of um a lot of the the conjunctions of the past you, know, mm -hmm. you have these these kind of real real breakthroughs um and and uh, moments moments of of discovery where we realize you know the world isn't quite as as we imagined it um so there's there's growth there but it's also kind of it's often has a sort of surprising uranian side to it it's not it's not something we were expecting to learn yeah well i think in ren butler's book the archetypal universe one of the things he says about pairing together uranus and jupiter is quantum leap you know something's going to sort of take you know the electron valence thing way outside the bounds of something we expected or that we were considering and you know just looking at the cycle as a general pairing archetypally without the signage of taurus um, you know, that, which happens every 14 years or so, um, there have been a lot of like revolutionary energies, right? Like wanting to rebel, break free, 
bust out of some constriction or straitjacket of a system. And, you know, if you go back to like the American Revolution or the French Revolution or the civil rights protests of 68, 69, um, you know, we're talking about 75, 76, 78, 70, 89, 80, 68, 69, those energies or 2000, 2011 or Occupy Wall Street, right? Breaking out of like, you know, something we want to we want to bust out of something like this is the status quo. Let's break it. Let's break free. You know, you're just always going to see something that says like, it's like kind of like taking the cutting, taking something to a new edge, right? An edge that's not been here before. So we, you know, we can look at this time, I think, fixed sign, Taurus, earth, currency, cryptocurrencies, maybe things to do with the earth itself, you know, maybe a radical new breakthroughs in agriculture and uh, currency structures. What else could we come up with? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if we um, if we kind of have a look back to, to what's happened before when we've had Jupiter-Uranus conjunctions in Taurus, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we had the last one in, in 1941, but if we go back to 1858, um, that was a very interesting moment. Um, this was this was when um, Charles Darwin and another and another, another fellow um, uh, whose name has has almost been kind of been forgotten, Wallace. Um, he he also kind of came to similar conclusions as Charles Darwin about the idea of um, evolution by natural selection. And you know this was they they announced um, this theory in 1858 uh, at a um, society called the Linnaean Society, and you know this completely blew apart our ideas about you know, the nature of nature of our origins. But it was almost like how, you know how does the body kind of create itself? You know, the evolution um, it's very kind of it's very earthy, material, bodily. You know you can see the the moon's exaltation in Taurus there. But we came to this sort of radical new understanding of what you know what it what is a human being and and how do we get here? Um, so I think some I think we could potentially expect some really interesting insights into um, our, our our nature as humans. Perhaps some something around genetics. I'm thinking you know, that is a, certainly a possibility. And we've also got to bear in mind that the context of next year, you know, we can, we're going to have Pluto in Aquarius. We've got this. This AI revolution underway, which is, you know, undoubtedly going to, going to, going to go up a gear uh, next year when when Pluto makes that shift. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm what I'm thinking about a lot is, well, what what's hidden in the data that um, we might find revealed by by AI tools? So I think um, you know part of what we might see you know, we can we can try and put these put these um, these big uh, transits together into a kind of into a single moment because obviously they're all kind of you know they're all happening at the same time and they all they all come together to to create the moment at the time so I'm wondering about kind of new revelations about about uh, the earth about our bodies about our origins maybe about animals um, mm -hmm. something something I'm quite interested in is this uh, project um, called CETI. I think it's, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's to do with whales and their language. And they're using AI to try to um, try to understand whale language. So, That's a fascinating one. Oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Because the quantum leap part of the Jupiter Uranus is the AI technology, not so much for just the fascination that this being like, you know, this robot like Sophia or whatever can look like and talk like a human, but also what it can do that our minds cannot do, really. What it can process, what it can create, what it can understand that we can't do it, but the AI technology can. I love the idea of learning to the, the language of whales. I love love the idea of a deeper decode of the origins of humanity. That one really resonates for me for some reason, especially as we're moving towards yet again, another kind of perilous time in history where we see, you know, the old, you know, the old daunting threat of nuclear armament or nuclear destruction or nuclear war still percolating through our, our culture with, you know, current world events and, and, you know, heating up in the Middle East, especially. And, you know, we all think we're, I don't know, I, I kind of hoped we were all past that, you know, I kind of thought, you know, the end of the Cold War, the de disarmament, uh, but the, the non-usability the non of those weapons, I mean, you cannot use those weapons. 
You just can't use them. So we have weapons that you can't use without destroying the, the land, destroying the ecosystem, destroying the, the world, basically. And, um, you know, the whole atomic era, right, started in, which video was I listening to? Was that your Pluto-Neptune? Yeah, the atomic, the beginning of the atomic era began with that Pluto-Neptune cycle, the conjunction of Pluto and Neptune in, what year was that, darling? I forgot. Way back in, in Gemini, right? 18, Gemini. 19, 18, 19, yeah, 1891 and 1892, there were, there were three of them. And yeah, that's, this cycle is basically what I've, what I'm kind of obsessed with right now, because um, it, it's really the it's really the mother cycle, the Pluto Neptune cycle. I mean, at least of the, of the cycles that we know about, um, it's because it's the slowest. So all the the faster moving planets are kind of acting as triggers to this this deep cycle, which is kind of the base notes of history, essentially. Oh um, yes, base and- notes of history. I love the way you have phrased that. Yeah. Kind yeah, the back the back end of it all. What's going on? And and right now we're coming into that uh, sex, sextile, right? So we've been moving through a longer range of time since the nineteen thirties, was it, or late to, in the nineteen forties? Um, because I remember your video, which I really enjoyed. Everyone go watch it. It really brings the whole UFO phenomena into the phenomena into the into the light of day a bit as well as atomic weaponry and developments. But you you go through the conjunction, this a uh, semi sextile. Um, semi-square sextile. So we're heading into the sextile era of that particular synodic cycle. And it's pretty fascinating that we're going to peak out around, was it 2026 and get very intense again? Yeah. Would you like me to to show? Yeah. That, that Let me chart? share that with you. Yeah. I'm going to get, give you the uh, option to share. And everyone also, we'll talk about Jupiter and Uranus in terms of some UFO phenomena that I've been digging up, but it overlaps with what's happening with the Jupiter Neptune. And my prediction is we're going to find more proof I just want to predict something, you know, just for fun. I think that 2024 is the, the time when we actually acknowledge and, and we have common consensus that there have been retrieved bodies, not just crafts. There are alien bodies, whatever that is. You know, there's like something that doesn't look human. And that is because in 1941, this Cape Girardeau episode that happened went in the spring in Missouri, there was a UFO sighting by a Baptist minister, a, a crashed uh saucer type thing. He was told by the government not to ever speak about it. When he got old, he told his daughter, told his family. Now it became a book and maybe even a movie for all I know. And this incident, it wasn't just that there was a a crashed object. He said there was a body of a non-human entity. And that theme of retrieval of bodies feels like it's really happening right now in our collective with the David Grush revelations and stuff. So I'm going to open up your ability here by giving you, I think I just give you co-host. It's the easiest way to do it. Hang on. Uh, find you in my participants and give you a co-host status, making you co-host now. So yeah, I'm just, I can't wait because all my life I thought I'd live through that. I thought I'm going to live through the time when you, if I've seen two UFOs in my life and uh, I've told you I'm an experiencer, so we can bring that in later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, this, this subject is also my, one of my current obsessions as well. Um, and the reason that I that I really um, that I think it's kind of rising right now is essentially this 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 um, Pluto Neptune cycle. So what what we're looking at here, we're looking at a chart from the Archetypal Explorer website, and this allows us to visualize aspects. Now, the the, the really interesting thing about the Pluto Neptune cycle, it's five hundred years long, and and what happens with this um, this cycle is because Pluto's orbit is eccentric. Uh, there's a, there are periods where uh, Pluto essentially speeds up and just starts moving at the same speed around the zodiac as Neptune. So they get into um, get into um, aspects that just last a really long time. They'll have a there's a, a very long hundred year uh, sextile in their cycle and then a hundred year trine later on. And what we're looking at here is a chart showing how close together in degrees the two planets were. Uh, from basically, well, in the 20th century up to today. So this line that you see here, the vertical line, that's you know that's where we are now, end of 2023. But what you can see is, so this this basically uh, is the first major aspect of this Pluto-Neptune cycle. It began in 1891 and 1892. So the the things that were happening at the end of the 19th century. That's the conjunctional period of this cycle. And that's those are the kind of that's the seed moment. 
So if you look at what happens at these seed moments, these conjunctional moments, you can kind of see the themes that are then going to going to expand, that are going to, to be born into the world. And it's like microcosm and macrocosm. So the mm -hmm. microcosm is the conjunctional period. And it, it's, it's really all there. And one of the things, as you mentioned, uh, that goes back to that period is atomic theory. So we discovered the electron in 1897. That was when you know, the two planets are well within all the conjunction. Um, Einstein, a little bit later, 1905, he comes up with E equals MC squared. And, and then over the minor aspects, so the semi-sextile, semi-square, we discovered the proton and then the neutron. And in the 1940s, the sextile comes into orb. And of course, you know, we all know what happened then. You have 1942, first controlled uh, fission reaction, and of course, the Manhattan Project, and then the, the bombs in 1945. Um, so... We can really see how when the sextile came into orbit, what was promised at the conjunction, the nuclear technology unlocking the secrets of the atom really you know, comes to fruition in the most you know, dramatic way possible. Um, but what's really interesting is you can really see um, by looking at how close together the, the planets were, you can kind of see the story of the 20th century just, just in this cycle, in this aspect. Because we've, you know, we've basically been in this really long sextile uh, for a long time. But what you can see is that there are two periods where this sextile was going exact. Once mm -hmm. between 1950 and 1956, and then another between 1976 and 1986. But the two planets separated a little bit between those two periods, but, but not much. So this long period here, this was, well, what was this? This was, this was the Cold War. This was the period when... We had the threat of nuclear weapons hanging over us, you know, pretty much throughout this period. When the planets um, began to separate, you can see that sort of by 1990, they're starting to move away. We had this big dip. And, you know, what happened then? We, you know, the Cold War ended, the Soviet Union disintegrated, and, and the, the, the sort of imminent threat of nuclear weapons went away. Now we're getting back to this final period of exact sextiles. You can see that there's a peak again coming between 2026 and 2032. And you know, things are heating up a little bit again. You know, people are, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of tension in geopolitics. You're hearing talk of nuclear weapons again and threats and so on. Now, I want to be clear, you know, I don't think, I don't think um, this is saying, you know, we're heading towards, you know, a nuclear war. That's not what I want, you know, people to take from this. But mm -hmm. what I would suggest is that the tension, is, it's like a kind of, it's it, it, it i think it's like the pressure under which the new world is formed almost because that was that pressure um you know that nuclear competition between the united states and the usr ussr in the nine, particularly in the 1980s eventually that that kind of broke the soviet union and we kind of moved into this period here where we we had a kind of unipolar world for a while where the united states was the, the main superpower we're kind of coming back to this last period of this sort of formation of the new world here and once again there's a, there's a lot of tension um but you the other thing you mentioned is ufos you know ufos um well uh, people probably know and as you mentioned there was this incident in 1941 i'm not actually wasn't actually aware of that and, and the fact that that happened at a jupiter uranus conjunction is incredibly interesting. Yeah, it was, I, exa I it was exact. That. It was like, I think it was within the same month of the, it was the spring like of 1941. It was right with that conjunction, you know, and it was kind of one wow. of those, a bit of a hidden thing because the guy was afraid to speak, right? Until it became, he got elderly out and started to tell everyone about it. But it, it was like a seed energy for that Jupiter Uranus, yeah. That's really interesting because, I mean, what, what a lot of people will be aware, more aware of is, you know, there's the kind of flying disc craze of the of like 1946 and then Roswell 1947. And, you know, in, in this period here from the 40s, mm -hmm. people went UFO crazy. In 1952, um, year of an exact uh, sextile, there was this incident supposedly where these these um, these ships were seen around the Capitol, in Washington, D.C., um, yeah. And, and this whole period really was kind of, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even early 90s with the X-Files and so on, was kind of this heyday of UFO madness. I mean, you know, maybe I shouldn't use the word madness, but, you know, it was it was the it was the day it was a period when the phenomenon was very much on our minds. And I find it interesting that that coincided with um, this kind of almost apocalyptic threat. 
that existed at the same time with the nuclear bomb because it's weird that both both of the both that threat and the ufo phenomenon kind of receded in the early Absolutely. 2000s yeah yeah to the point where they, they disbanded away. remember plot project blue book and the, the search for you know what the aerial phenomena was, they even closed it down during that dip. You know what I mean? The government stopped officially investigating it. So it's almost like the whole, I was alive, you know, born in the 60s, 70s. I'm the one who lived through that excitement of the, you know, the UFO phenomena, saw something that I couldn't identify as a child and also saw something when I was with my sisters and my neighbor. So this would be like the late 60s. Like I live in, lived in Northern Canada where there were no uh, airports or air traffic. We didn't even have a flight pattern above us and um, three silver round objects flying above us on a cloudless day. And we all witnessed it. And we're like, what? Silent, silent, silent. And then later on, in, uh, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I was hiking up in the Potomac River area. And I watched a before drones. I mean, we're talking about, I'm sure there were drones, but like, not really. It was like, I don't know, not, 1991. And like a silent bronze disc Fly, floating above me across the Potomac River. I was on a cliff and I'm like, what? I know my kid was hiking with my husband at the time and they were behind me and I was ahead. I'm like, oh guys, get out of here now. You know, like come witnesses. I'm not losing my mind, right? I want them to see the thing. But of course, by the time they got up there, the thing was no longer visible. But when you go back to the cycle of like the, the peak there, 19, you know, 80, 81, 82, 83, that's also Whitley Stryber's communion that came out sometime, I think, in the late 80s or maybe early 90s, maybe 80, 89, 90. And it's like suddenly it hit the collective psyche, right? Like, oh, my God, you know, the big eyeballs, the black eyeballs and the little narrow jaw. Yeah, that was really a heyday, you know, kind of the late 70s. You had Close Encounters of the Third Kind. You had E.T., I think that was 83. Um, as his Strieb, the, Whitley Strieber's encounter, he, I think the book came out later, but his encounter supposedly happened um, in this early 80s period. Um, mm -hmm. and these, So it was a real kind of, as I say, a, a, a heyday. Now what we can see happening is that this phenomenon is kind of re-entering public consciousness again. Um, it's since 2017, we, we had the military start releasing these videos going, we don't know what these are. And then, of course, um, this year we've had David Grush say, saying, you know, saying um, that the US government has crashed craft and bodies, you know, which is um, going back to what you mentioned happening in 1941, another Ju Jupiter-Uranus conjunction. Now, yeah. so... You know, Pluto, I think I think uh, Pluto in Aquarius is another factor here that also maybe speaks to this phenomenon because um, previous Pluto in Aquarius transits, we've seen um, peoples of the world suddenly discovering each other. So the one in the uh, the 16th century, we kind of, this was the sort of period where the sort of European Spanish conquistadors were conquering and you know um starting their colonial empires in south america and we had in the net in the, the previous one the late 18th century there, there was more of that i mean this was when europeans showed up in australia and of course there were already people in australia and you know sort of planted a flag and did you know something similar once again and obviously um this didn't turn out well for the indigenous people in, in either of these situations but there was this real there was this kind of if you, the, sort of archetypally, there's a sense of of the of a new center suddenly being revealed, or at least a new like you you think that your kind of civilization is kind of alone on the planet, and suddenly there's another one. You know, Aquarius being the sign opposing um, Leo, the sign of the center. Aquarius being the sign of the you know, perhaps of the stranger or the outsider, um, and and yet. Today, we, we find ourselves in a position where all the civilizations, the human civilizations of the world are, are well aware of each other. Um, so I'm wondering about this Pluto and Aquarius transit having to do with um, the revealing of, of other intelligences. Now, we know that that's happening with AI, so we don't even need to go crazy with the alien stuff you know, to already know that that's happening. And then that's also why I'm drawn to this idea of, of perhaps us um, becoming aware of the intelligence of animals as well and the, the consciousness uh, of whales perhaps and so on right right then, right i love it yeah yeah and then the well, the other the other one of course is the potential for um these other non-human intelligences whatever they may be now i'm not necessarily convinced they are 
kind of um, space aliens, although they may be, but there's all these other <laughs> theories for what they are. What I am convinced is that it, it is a real phenomenon because so many people like yourself have had these experiences. Um, yeah. So the real, the real important question is, how do we interpret this phenomenon? What is it? And is it really for, you know, is it for the military, say, for example, or the government to tell us what the what this um, this phenomenon is when perhaps it's something really fundamental to um, to life on Earth and perhaps says something very important about who we are and what we're doing here. Um, and so the question of kind of how that narrative is defined. Um, what we what we decide about the nature of this phenomenon is really important and i suspect as you might be right that um around the time of the conjunction in the first part of next year we're going to see some quite interesting revelations about this this thing because the other reason the other reason i say that is because we're um once again getting close to these exact sextiles so this pluto neptune cycle and by the way, this cycle also, if you go back to its root, the late 1890s, there was this wave of mystery airship sightings yes, in the United States. I was going to bring that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the whole, yeah, what are these mystery airships about? And you know, here we are again. I like the idea of the base notes that you said that, you know, basically we're looking at, you know, the background base note of the Pluto, uh, inception of the Pluto um, Neptune uh, cycle in the late 1800s. But if I, if you think of that as a base note, then let's say that the Jupiter Uranus is like, you know, a flute that's going on here that, you know, if I go back and think of the 1941 episode that led to the Roswell in the later forties that led to the UFO craze in the fifties, every synodic cycle has a kind of a 14 year singing, a 14 14-year song. And the 14-year Taurus song that overlapped with this cycle that you're sharing with us here led to the first big energies that we've seen in our last hundred years to do with everyone talking about news stories about UFOs, maybe non-human entities, bodies, and all of that stuff. So that was already, that. that's what that brought up. And now you're, what I hear what I feel like um, with this new cycle that's coming into being, uh, coming up back in Taurus, is that we're going to see the base notes of this phenomena that also involves the, the idea of perhaps aliens, airships, other beings, other intelligences. And I love the Pluto element, you know, Pluto and Aquarius, like the other, the foreigner, the stranger, but the paradigm shift of that, like the shock of that, to be the indigenous Australian people and suddenly see these other beings coming in with, you know, their Western Europeanness and their, you know, the shock of the others that they didn't necessarily understand were available to them or the the culture shock basically and, and a paradigm shift with it. So I would love for this to look like a shift for the world, you know, that old we're not alone or the truth is out there and we're not alone because, you know, our, our the way we operate right now, the collective psyche of humanity is, is really xenophobic and fear-based and you're afraid of your neighbor, you know, because they have a different skin color or you're afraid of, you know, the people on the other side of a border. But now we're looking at what about a, a border that we've never seen, like the border of another planet or the border of another dimension and an intelligence that interacts with us here. And that would really shift, I think, the collective psyche in a huge way and get us to like wake the f up. <laughs> like, you know, I think so. Mean, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about kind of themes of like, um, if you we mentioned this uh, thing about Charles Darwin and and the um, theory of evolution by natural selection, also coming at one of these um, Jupiter Uranus and Taurus conjunctions. So we're kind of getting to this this theme of kind of real fundamental questions of like, who, who are we? And, um, and I think this phenomenon could have a real interesting bearing on that. Um, and expect, maybe in the way that you say as well, in the way that um, it, it would uh, suddenly, I think we would feel a lot more perhaps, um, I don't know if fraternal is a, a gendered word, but you know, kind of, <laughs> like we'd sort of neighborly or like we'd feel a, what's the, what's the right word uh, a lot more kind of um a lot more in common with our fellow man when we or, or woman when we realize um that we may not be alone you know that we're all the same species but there are other species um in mm -hmm. you know in in active on, on our planet and then there are all these other weird weird sort of um directions that this can go because if you follow this this ufology field you'll you'll see that um there are there are these claims that go around like suggesting that um 
these beings have had a hand in kind of our evolution and messing with our DNA and all that stuff. And it get, you know, there's all this kind of this quite far out uh, quite claims, which may or may not be true. I honestly don't know. I, I, I kind of feel like anything's possible, but those are things that people are saying in these, in some of these circles, particularly in um, circles that are some of them that are connected to military and intelligence. So are we, you know, might we hear some strange claims like that? Because oh. I mean, Tom DeLong is, is talking about this Tom DeLong from Blink-182, um, who is, uh, you know, a, a very well-known ufologist. So. No, yeah, that would make it, sense it, though, because if you're tying it to the, uh, the uh, evolutionary, uh, you know, natural selection theory that, you know, kind of snap people away from the idea of, you know, the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago, and everybody suddenly appeared from Adam and Eve. But, you know, if you kind of went with what well, it had its consequences too, right? I mean, it became like a reason to go survival of the fittest, and it became quite a mercenary ph philosophy to let the people who couldn't, you know, do well, the, the lack of thrival, uh, to be your problem. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it, it really, it really had people reframe the 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 way we became the homo sapiens sapiens species how we became what we are and it may not have been you know one day with an adam and an eve and a rib and there might have been a longer process that was involved in that although later on i mean natural selection does operate we see it all the time you know the famous example of it, it would be the the in the industrial age in europe the the birds change from white to, to darker colored you know, the darker birds survived. I can't remember what species it was because it would be adapting and not being, and, and by coating or camouflaging with the fact that we had industrial revolution pollutants or whatever, they were less visible. And so then the, the species adapted and became the blacker or darker birds survived and the whiter ones didn't. So that's an adaptive response, right? But um, the whole evolutionary theory did fall apart later on and people don't know that. And that had to do with the fossil records and punctuated equilibrium and an understanding that they could never find an actual species that mutated to another species in the fossil records. They can never find it. So it wasn't like, you know, the ape became the human, the human, you know, that didn't, there's no record for that. So no, most people don't understand that that theory didn't actually hold up, that we did not adapt to the point of species shift. We adapted within a species. So a species could change within its speciation by adapting to the environment for survival. That's just a mechanism. But the, there is no evidence for an actual species evolving into another species. So then if we look at this, what's going to happen this time, and we're coming into a time where we have AI to help us solve problems, look at the human genome at a little dip, deeper level, maybe talk to the whales who tell us what really happened. <laughs> um, you know, we are going to have maybe one of those big reframes again, that literally has us ask ourselves, where are we, where did we come from and how did we get here in this body you know, in this being of human. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm intrigued. I mean, what, <laughs> one way I've heard um, heard AI described is is like a torch that can uh, can shine a light in places that we can't really see because we're we're not able to pass this data, but AI can do that, and that's that's um, it poses an incredible opportunity and a kind of quite a big risk as well because in terms of um, in terms of our privacy it's obviously quite worrying if you can join all these different data sets that exist together then it does enable um kind of the kind of possibilities for kind of surveillance and kind of knowing exactly who you are and what you're you know what you're what you're into and what you believe and where you go and who you associate with all of that can be put together very easily with a with ai so there's a kind of worrying uh risk to it but at the same time it also has a lot of potential because it's essentially, you know, it, it's the it can just dig into these reams of data and 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 pull up meaning that we could never possibly hope to do ourselves. You know, and it's also potentially the um, the, the the greatest investigative journalist who ever lived because you know what teams of journalists would do when they were trying to to dig up the truth is kind of go rooting through data and um, records and so on. You know, AI can do all this stuff really easily. So it has this kind of amazing liberatory potential and also quite the reverse. So I think it's, you know, when in my work, I always try to try to um, bring out both potentialities um, in the hope that we can we can essentially avoid sleepwalking into the the, the kind of the, the darker possibilities 
and choose the lighter ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's something about the whole Taurus thing too. And I, I don't have the research in, under my belt about what was happening 1858, you know, adds, you know, 15 years, but I'm going to imagine there was some significant archaeology going on as well. You know, perhaps, you know, the Brits were in Egypt or something, but I'm, I'm kind of having a feeling for some reason that, you know, even if it's not AI directed, which it could be, and AI is going to like, you know, clobber the uh, <laughs> Egyptologists who still want to say that the pyramids are like 2,500 years old or something when they're clearly not. Uh, Gobeki Tepli is an example of this revelation of the antiquity of some of these incredibly, you know, huge monumental stone structures composed in ways that make no sense, you know, not pulleys and ropes. So these kinds of things, looking back at the ar archaeological records, looking back at what we already know, having a better understanding of what's actually true, like Graham Hancock, Fingerprints of the Gods, what, why were these monuments left? A lot of them are astronomical monuments for looking at the sky and keeping track of data, literally like, you know, celestial motion. But it would be really nice if somebody would finally say dig under the pyramid or under the sphinx or somebody would finally do something if they haven't already <laughs> or maybe it's already in the vatican and we just don't know it but like these kinds of revelations about our ancient history with taurus is earth fixed uranus is disruptive and shaking it up right <laughs> um, and breaking it up and jupiter's wisdom truth and knowledge and so it would be really lovely to see some clarity come in just at the archaeological historical um axis of reality reality. What do you think? No, I, I absolutely agree. I, I, and I think there's, there are really, there are really two kind of broad um, areas that these Jupiter Uranus conjunctions tend to tend to bring out. And the first of them is kind of the stuff we've been talking about. So um, real sort of uh, creative breakthroughs and breakthroughs in knowledge and understanding. Um, breakthroughs particularly i think we can expect in, in this time around in in the arts in um, food kind of human origins nature so on all, all these kind of um taurian kind of areas the other the other um possibility though we also have to bear in mind with these conjunctions is they also seem to often serve as kind of sparks that that, that lit fire like fires and kind of um we we start to see this kind of explosion of kind of um liberatory energy um and so in history it's also been some some uh some of the kind of years that everybody kind of knows in history so um we think back to to 1789 we have the french revolution 1775 uh, 14 years earlier um you know we have the you know, the american revolution breaking out um we can also look at other years like uh, 1914 um, you know, the, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand um, and the, the sort of sudden sudden um, beginning of World War One. We've got 1941, kind of the height of the Blitz. Um, so, I mean, even going more recently, in fact, 2010, 2011, we had the we had Occupy. We also had the we had the Arab Spring. Arab um, Spring. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the other thing that I'm, you know, that I'm a little bit um, nervous about with this um, conjunction is the possibility that it's it's, it's going to um, lead to some kind of, you know, outbreak of, uh, I mean, a violence or some sort of, you know, insurgency or liberatory um, kind of movements. I mean, it, a lot of these things can often tend turn into things that you know, when we look back on in the future, we say, ah, that was a good thing. It was good that that happened. But often mm -hmm. these aren't necessarily pleasant things to to live through and no so. absolutely and you know even just uranus going through taurus that was the dust part of the dust bowl era it was uh, the uh, part of the great depression last time it was also you know the rise of fascism and right-wing di dictatorships so you know it's not always going to like yeah these these themes do seem to want to repeat you know and even now i mean i have nothing against like I mean, there are right wing people in the world. That's fine with me. I'm not judging anybody, right? But you know, elections in France and Hungary and movements, you know, in the time of the 2010-11 era, uh, even though this wasn't a conjunction in uh, the sign of Taurus, it was still the same archetype of Jupiter Uranus. So, I think one of the things I'd say is that we're definitely going to have to buckle up. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> because it, it could definitely be something you should get your seatbelt on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think so. I think so. I mean, I mean yeah. one of the re the regions that um I think 
this may point to, towards is the Middle East as well. Um, I've looked at a lot of charts of countries around um, the Middle East, including you know, Israel, Iran, Syria, all sorts. And a lot of them have placements which are getting stimulated by this Jupiter Uranus conjunction at 21 degrees Taurus. Right. Have, the su uh, the sun of Is the sun of Israel, right? The sun of Israel is in late Taurus somewhere, last deacon of Taurus. Yes, yes. And um, you know, the, the Iran chart, I think Iran has uh Uranus at 20 Scorpio, so it's it's a Uranus opposition for Iran. So, you know, Jupiter Uranus opposing Uranus, that's you'd think that would be significant. It's very it's also very um very big in the Syria chart and so on. And if you actually if you look at the astro map for this uh conjunction so i don't know if your um, viewers are familiar with astro mapping but you know it's a technique that allows you to kind of see where in the world um this conjunction, the conjunction will be on the will be on the angles you know it kind of shows you where okay. it's kind of when it goes exact which suggests kind of which kind of places are most likely to be uh affected and you know the line does go quite close to iran um mm -hmm. russia as well mm -hmm. and so yeah, so I do I do have some worries, especially given you know what's going on in that region already. Um, yeah. As to you know, is this a kind of could this conjunction also be a spark that kind of uh, ignites a, a a bigger fire or something like that? Yeah. You know, these yeah. conjunctions can really go two ways, and that's what Andre Barbeau said as well, uh, the famous French mundane astrologer. He said he he really said that they you, you can't really tell uh, sort of. You can't really say in advance this is going to be a good thing or or, or not because they can go both ways. That's the nature of Uranus, um, and well, yeah, and then these tense that, times. But, yeah, and even a bad thing is a good thing sometimes. It's that old parable, you know, with the farmer's son gets you know broken leg and uh, now he can't work the farm, and is it a good thing or a bad thing? And then there's a war, but his son can't go. So you know what I mean? There's always a even a bad thing has yeah. a good thing underneath it. And, you know, one of the things I, I thought was fascinating, I listened to the Ind young Indian, um, you know, like phenomena, the guy's 17 now, but he was 13 or 14 when he predicted the pandemic. Um, and he, you know, sidereal astrologer, Indian guy, he's obviously a prodigy. I mean, you just listen to him, he's reincarnated ancient sage astrologer, really cool kid. And he was talking, he predicted the Israel, three days before the October 7th event, he did a video predicting a, a breakout of a war in the Middle East. And I think he even named the countries involved. And um, and he has said from his sidereal astrological perspective, this is not going to be over anytime soon. That it will go at least a year and a half, eighteen months. It's not a it's not a a month long war or conflagration because the seed of it cannot be resolved in a short time. So again, does this expand out to the other nations of Iran, Russia? Russia's putting troops on the Syrian border as we speak. You know, the Golan Heights is in dispute. So all of this makes me feel, unless there's a divine intervention, which is fine with me, <laughs> or the aliens come down and talk to us about it, you know, this is looking like it's going to be a domino effect kind of event, you know, where a local a local issue is going to explode geopolitically. And um, and I just can't see it not doing that. But again, is it good or is it bad? Because in the long run, what is the outcome, right? So if you're, you're Palestinian and you've been in a lockdown for 17 years and you've been, uh, you know, dispersed from your homeland since, you know, the 1948-49 timeframe and the Nakba, well, you know, this is a good thing because even though there's such a loss of life, there's a whole world that knows what you've been going through. I mean, so even if this thing spreads beyond the nations, and I'm not taking sides, listeners, beyond the nations involved, there's still, there's an expression I like to use, something good is always trying to happen. Something in the divine mind is trying to create something good from chaos. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I love that that parable that you mentioned, the par the parable of the Chinese farmer. It's it's uh, it's one of my favorites as as well because um, it, we we simply do not have the divine knowledge to understand, you know, why these things need to happen a lot a lot of the time. Um, so yes, it's it, kind of the 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 really the truly wise, I think, sort of reserve reserve judgment. But um, I think it may be. A pretty rocky like road the next the next few years um you know there's a there there are um you know, astrologers 
like Barbeau, the guy I was mentioning before, who really thought that there was a, a crisis which would last until 2026. And um, he was very clear. He thought that after that time, um, everything looked kind of quite rosy because we're actually, if you look at the outer planet cycles, mm -hmm. the cycles of Pluto, Neptune and Uranus, um, they are, they're all um, in um, kind of expanding phases, particularly once you get to, um, once you get to 2026 and Saturn uh, conjoins Neptune, then we have all these cycles that are, that are waxing. So there's kind of growth happening and they're not in tense aspects either. They're not in squares. They're in. No, oh, we're going to get a nice little, a nice little trine out of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have a yeah. feeling too. we're in, we're in like a really like this, like your graph is showing, you know, we can see this kind of intensity building up around 2026, but that plateau that looks to, like it goes roughly to 2035 as Pluto's still going through Aquarius, that can, that doesn't have to look like horrific stuff. It could look like stabilizing, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I I think so. I mean, my I, I think um, you know maybe Barbo's right, and maybe some somehow uh, from twenty twenty six things start to look um, much better. And you know, I wouldn't bet against Barbo, who who's a you know brilliant uh, legendary astrologer. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe we kind of have to go through a few sort of rocky years as this sort of as some kind of new world settle settlement kind of is kind of comes into into yeah. place. Um, and maybe so perhaps we have to kind of go, get to the, get through this um, period here and sort of once these um, so the sex style starts separating the kind of period of kind of this of some sort of new worlds being formed is kind of uh, kind of done that work is work is complete and we don't have to worry too much until you know <laughs> till later next, in the century. So the next yeah. big thing. Yes, I hear you. I'll have it a square. Um, to me, uh, you know, there's a, a feeling of uh, intensity, like intuitively, because I do, I see the world that way as well. And then I think there is a pause in, in like hostilities. I, if I had my way, it would be um, some sort of consciousness that's not human getting in touch with humanity, either we could call them an alien because we might determine that's what they are as an extraterrestrial or an interdimensional entity. And you and I, briefly touched on in our conversation by email, you know, the Jacques Vallée content that suggests that we've always been interacting with what we used to call fairies and they leave fairy rings. And now we have crop circles and they're more intricate, geometrical, actually they're mathematical and there's no explaining them. They're not two guys with a, a board flattening the grass. Because I used to, I was friends with a researcher into the crop circle stuff. He had a scanning electron microscope. He's passed away now. And I mean, it's the way there's a bending of the stock that has nothing to do with mechanical force. It's to do with heat and a changing of the structure of the actual grass or grain or crop. And it and then the structures that we're seeing in the crop circles are like literally math math. If you it's literally like, you know, like like Stonehenge is really an observatory. And the the actual math is encoded in this, like an intelligence that's not human is leaving us intelligent data in the grass but back in like the the you know the fairy lore days it was just fairies leaving fairy rings on the ground right disturbed crop in the shape of a ring we've always had this interacting intelligence that morphs you know as technology goes through its own iterations before they were lights and then they were you know fairy beings and then they were um balloons in the sky there was a huge 1858 uh, then go 1960 to 65, a bunch of balloons. They kept having these sightings of balloons because they could conceive of balloons. They couldn't conceive of flying saucers or, you know, a technological thing in the sky. So I think we keep interpreting some kind of interface between this world and another or this intelligence of humanity and another consciousness as we have our ability to process it. And you brought that up with Fati the Fatima, um, the Virgin Mary thing. Can you mention that again in 1917? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that I was looking at when I was tracing this cycle was um, I mentioned the the minor aspects. So uh, around the time of the First World War, um, Pluto and Neptune re reached a semi sextile. So that's a, a 30 degree aspect. Um, and you know, it really span the time they were in orb of that really spans the First World War. It was obviously a very difficult time, but in 1917, um, at the kind of the height of the war, this was also the year of a Saturn Neptune conjunction, which is kind of interesting because another one of those is coming in 2026. Mm -hmm. There was the, the whole story of the miracle of Fatima, 
um, where this, you know, this um, Mary apparition appeared to three shepherd children repeatedly over many months and then uh, made, made some predictions and told them that she would perform a miracle on a certain date. And um, thousands of people gathered at this place in Fatima in Portugal, and they witnessed this um, amazing sight where this kind of bright disc, which seemed to be the sun, started kind of dancing in the sky and you know, doing all this miraculous, strange stuff, which kind of sounds you know, to, to a lot of UFO researchers, people like Jacques Vallée, like a flying saucer or some kind of um, you know, experience with a UFO. And that came in 1917. And again, at one of these important aspects of this cycle. Um, you know, so there's a few things that are pointing to 2026 being interesting because we have another Saturn-Neptune um, conjunction. And Saturn-Neptune is, you know, what is that? I, mean, I mentioned Saturn-Neptune earlier in that you know, Neptune is, signifies kind of the numinous and the world beyond, the world of the, with the imagination and of, of faith and and of spirits and and Saturn, of course, is the the concrete, the manifest. And so, when these two planets meet, you you have these um, interesting moments of manifestations or attempts to structure the ineffable. Um, and so, this is another reason why you know there's, there are strange things pointing to 2026, 2027, and particularly as regards this this phenomenon. And I think I think what the, just to allude to. Or something you alluded to just now as well it, you know some people kind of are quite skeptical about the re reality of this phenomenon um and especially skeptical of it being um alien and um i, I do think it's quite interesting that you know in, in times past we we believed in these kind of um beings of folklore like you mentioned you know the fairies and um the the jinn and all these kind of different um beings that people believed in across the world you know in, in recent times and we, we adopted this really um sort of objectifying technological mindset um towards what or at least some of us did and um you know, the, the cultures in power did and and so we started to just see everything as technology and see these beings as well they must be kind of beings that are riding around in technology of some kind and as you mentioned um it, it may well be that uh, that that we these are just beings that have always been there, and it's it's us that 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 have changed. It's how we see how we see them, you know, and is there some potential for a broadening of consciousness if we uh, can find a way to kind of move beyond this this kind of very sort of objectifying mindset that we've had? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I I'm fascinated by this whole this whole train of conversation. You know, I was in Scotland years ago, well, many times, but and I stayed in a little a little house, you know, in an area where there's this mountain range and you know you can see it from the home, and the owners are like they were all about the fairy lights, and all the villagers knew about the fairy lights. You know what I mean? Like everyone saw the fairy lights that were always on the top of the mountain, coming down and dancing around these like balls of moving light, and the the lore of the of the people in this place that I stayed in, the village or town or whatever, it was that this was always there. It wasn't just, oh my God, there's a UFO phenomena, you know, these kinds of things of lights that can move in all kinds of zigzaggy ways, you know, just like that a uh, tic-tac thing in the 19, uh, 2017, you know, um, released by, you know, the uh, the pilot who says, called it a tic-tac, but the thing zigzags all over. Um, this kind of thing, it was probably called fairy lights before or fairy objects. And, you know, even fairies were known for maybe abducting people. So you didn't want to be abducted by the fairies. Well, that's the whole communion and the experience or phenomena of, of abductions, right? Of being taken and gone, you go somewhere else and you're either given some great information about the fate of the world or your, your genitals are prodded. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Who gets the, have you ever seen, have you ever seen this super, super funny Saturday Night Live skit about the alien abductions? Have you ever seen it? Oh, MG, no. I got to email it to you. So it's too hilarious. It was probably from the 80s. And, uh, and this one girl, like, these are the famous uh, Saturday Night Live crew, but two of them are like, it was numinous. They told me that it is all love and the world, you know, and like, they're all having these mystical, numinous, Neptunian type encounters with these beings. And you got the one girl going, well, they were just, you know, I can't even do her. Like, I don't know what, yeah, why you guys got that. Because I got, you know, they were playing with my boobies. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so you you won't you'll laugh you'll just laugh your head off because we even when you look at the phenomena of the abduction phenomena that really rattled everybody in the 80s and 90s and the you know the Betty Hill and Barney Hill and then the abductee the abductee experience or stuff you would get the people who were traumatized by these apparently violated violations you know uh, and the other ones who were reporting that they were talking to like you know beautiful intelligences that were giving them the nature of reality and how how love and light are one so it, and, and we're not talking about people channeling. We're talking about people saying they had experiences, but they're just so different. The range is so different. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's something you, you come to pretty quickly researching this field. There's a, there, there's a huge multiplicity of kinds of experiences from very scary and unpleasant to very uplifting and inspiring. And and it it, it you can probably imagine that that the world of these beings is much like our own. There's a range, you know, and they range from um, malevolent, malevolent to bene uh, benevolent and everything in, in between. Um, so yeah, it's all very confusing. I and mean, the other, the other confusing aspect is that it's also quite clear that um, intelligence agencies are very interested in it and have had a hand in kind of even trying to shape the, the mythos around it. Um, have um, been trying to influence how, you know, what people think about this phenomenon, um, how we perceive it, what it really is. And so there's all of that kind of part of it going on as well. So it, it all gets very complex and murky and you just find yourself in this strange hall of mirrors. But ah, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to kind of, you know, to, to kind of go all in on any particular explanation for what this, this thing is. But I really do genuinely believe that there is, you know, there is, there is something happening, and this astrology to me shows that it is going to become much more prominent in the next few years, and quite possibly next year. Yeah, I, I I got the same feeling, especially next year when we actually have the conjunction itself, and there's sort of an acute element of the you know what it's going to show us, like a seed event, and the you know the things that follow just before and after that in the year even after can be very much like almost like the. Uh, kind of the baked in energetic of what this cycles for like what are we going to see it look like in the 14 years that follow uh until you know the cancer conjunction in 2037 so i think to me it's going to be an exciting time to be alive i've always wanted to be alive when maybe somebody says there is really such a thing as an alien or a ufo or non-terrestrial or extra dimensional consciousness and so i can't wait myself i'm pretty jazzed <laughs> but I know, but I know that the whole last to finish our call today, maybe, is the, the whole intensity that's very revolutionary just with the archetype of Jupiter Uranus independent of, right? Um, like, you know, the sign in which it's happening has been seen throughout history. And so we're definitely looking at a time in which anything that needs to be, re you know, rebelled against or revolutionized is going to show up for us. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I do mean, you have the, any... other, the other okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I, I don't want to. I don't want to maybe confuse matters too much by talking about another cycle, but you know, it, it may also um, speak back to the um, to the Uranus Neptune cycle as well. You know, because we had conjunctions of those planets in 1993. It was really the the birth of the World Wide Web. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, we also kind of you could even when they were a bit further away, the, really the breakdown of the Soviet Union and kind of the world sort of somehow finding itself as one after having been kind of divided literally with a wall um, for for quite some time. So the, you know, the, that period of the nineties, I mean, maybe not not everywhere. It must have been difficult if you were in you know the former Soviet Union, but mm -hmm. in a lot of places, it was quite hopeful and op optimistic as well. Yes. Um, and there was, op you know, optimism about this kind of like sort of one world that we're that we were seemingly creating and have found ourselves in. And so, you know, I, I, I wonder if any kind of emancipatory moments and impulses that come are perhaps ultimately driving towards that, even if, um, the, you know, they might kind of manifest in, in quite difficult ways next year. Yeah, that's a really good point. That cycle is to be looked at. You know, even I was doing some research for next year's video on the Jupiter Uranus, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Mars Jupiter conjunction cycle in Taurus and to see what had happened in the four previous times of um, 19, uh, 19, 1870, 1906, 1942, 1989. Anyway, they always turn out to be a massive 
technological cycle, right? I, and I still have to figure out why, you know, but also there's a lot of things that go on um, when we're talking about, um, you know, well, <laughs> Jupiter. I mean, sometimes it gets so simple to me. I mean, it's, this is the ultimate knowledge and truth and wisdom archetype if you want to take it to the highest level. And was it your was it your channel that talks about the protective nature of Jupiter? Uh, did you did you do a video about how Jupiter keeps the asteroids belt from falling into us? Was that your was that your video? I love. I made a that. little short about that. I love that. I, I found that. That's how I found you. I think it's the first time I. I think I found you. And I'm like, wow, that is so that is so cool, because it is the greater benefic. And so there's something good that's trying to happen. So I'm always hopeful when Jupiter is involved in anything, no matter how disruptive, disabling, uh, you know, kinetic uh, intensity, intensity can happen, that Jupiter keeps showing up as a good guy. You know, so 19, 1906, it was the first wireless radio broadcast to the public. I mean, so I'm just watching this, you know, cycle of these conjunctions of Jupiter. Oh, Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter. And this is my notes for something I haven't put together yet. Yeah. So Jupiter will join on what date? What date? What date is that happening next year? Jupiter and Mars conjoining. Do you remember? Jupiter and Mars? Uh, yeah. No. I yeah, 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 yeah. Because I can't remember. And these are like really like scrawled notes and magic marker on a piece of paper. But anyway, so Jupiter brings good things. That's the whole point. And so even though we are in a time of incredible intensity and there's multiple base note cycles like the Pluto, the, the beautiful sextile base note of Pluto, Neptune that we're now experiencing in its peak here, um, we also have you know this uh, goodness in Jupiter with Uranus disruption. So I, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm always the eternal optimist. Well, that's that's a good way to be, I think. And there's some really nice uh, astrology coming in in May as well. You know, when Venus joins the the, the Taurus party as well. So, oh, yeah. um, so that looks like a a very nice time with uh, Jupiter, Uranus, Venus, um, the Sun, mm -hmm. Mercury, all kind of uh, having a a good yet kind of unusual, surprising time in in yeah, Taurus. Yeah, it's like a council of planets are gathering together. <laughs> it's going to be very interesting for sure. Uh, well, thank you, Dan, for coming today. And um, do you want to share anything for our audience about what you're up to, where they should find you, uh, a little bit about um, your readings, perhaps? And I, I know you do consultations and letting people know more about that right now so they can go find you after this. I know I, I introduced World Astrology Report uh, and all the links to your stuff will be in the description box. Yeah, so so I'm mainly um, working on my YouTube channel, as you say, World Astrology Report. You can find it on YouTube very easily. Um, and yeah, I do readings, danwaitsastrology.com. Um, you can book there. My my real, what I really like to do is help people find purpose and calling um, in their lives. If you know people who are looking for those kind of things or reach reach that kind of time in life, which we often all reach, where we're kind of thinking, I don't know what the hell. Uh, to do with myself now you know and I, I i really love to to help people in that in that position and i have a you know a few techniques that i like to to use for that um and also just just helping people to see that that their lives are meaningful that there are threads of meaning as i say on my site um that we can kind of uncover and see how cycles and um particular moments of import are kind of pointing to that that meaning yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the way you describe it in your website. It sounds very, very intriguing. Um, so I, I encourage people to give uh, you know Dan a try. I am so booked up now that I have nothing available to, uh, till August, but to have to open my calendar up and I'm not doing that. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> I'm moving in a stage of my practice where I think I'm, I'm moving away from one-on-one -on -one consults and just maybe doing videos and classes. But, um, but I'm, I, I'm really, really liking what you, how you describe what you're trying to help a client with on your website. So I really encourage people to, to give Dan a try. I bet you it's going to be an amazing experience. And when you said you have some tools and techniques you like, I know you're Hellenistic as well, or, you know, you know, you've done a lot of more traditional astrology. What is your favorite tool you use these days when you're seeing a client and helping discover, you know, the deeper meaning of their story? Um, my favorite tool, probably I like to look at, look at their, their lot of, lot of spirit. I like to look at, um, the decans that some of their major placements fall mm. into the 36 decans of the Zodiac. And then I combine that with the Zodiacal releasing, which is a, uh, a time Lord technique, which divides your life into a sequence of chapters. You can kind of see which chapters will have been 
particularly meaningful and and, and it, all these techniques work quite well together in terms of you know figuring out what we're what we're here to do and oh that's um, great and when yeah and when the truly uh, important moments have happened and will happen again that's wonderful. Yeah, I use a bit of that tool as well. It's my last as my I'm lazy on it. But when I do use it, I usually have clients gasp, you know, oh, my God, especially when it's, a, you know, loosing of the bonds period, and they're looking historically at what happened and, you know, reframing their lives. So that's a, an incredibly powerful tool to use for people. I, yeah, very cool that you use it. So um, yeah, wonderful. I'm really, I'm really delighted that you had the time today to come all the way from I think you're in Singapore right now. I can never remember your uh, I'm in Phuket, Phuket, Thailand. Oh, oh, yeah, where we had that uh, tsunami. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. My son was at on the beach the, the literally, uh, you know, just before. Like he got home and then the, then I had a friend in Vancouver who had been in the actual tsunami herself, but she she went to, to hike in the high hills that morning or that day. and uh, and But people she knew that she was staying with in the hotel didn't. And her and it was really devastating. She was like she was not the same woman when she came back from that. But I don't want to get into dark stories, but we do have Saturn traveling with the asteroid Gong Gong right now through Pisces and Neptune there. And I always think it's just hardship with water. But you had Gong Gong, the sea serpent, the asteroid, the Chinese sea serpent that destroyed the world, big catastrophes. And I think that's an ancient memory of the comet that may have hit the Earth that created the reglaciation re during the Younger Dryas period. But I don't like Gong Gong hanging on onto Saturn right now and it's where we always saw a lot of hardship with water but i think the wa word water and hardship is going to be so predominant over the next two years as well yeah thank you i really appreciate the time you took and this recording is going out in the first week of january and we're recording on december 18th for my patreon community and i'm going to stop the recording um I, can i do that with your screen on yeah i'm going to stop and say goodbye to dan thank you guys for listening don't forget to check his channel out don't forget to like and subscribe to this video and do all the things that you know you should do <laughs> thanks everyone